Okay, so this is work with Ed Greffenset on differentiable inductive logic programming. So our system, differentiable ILP, DILP, and if you guys can think of a better name, DILP is not a very good name, please um, tell me one, uh, learns logic programs from examples, specifically uh, data log programs. It learns them using gradient descent and is robust to no noisy and ambiguous data. I can't go into all the technical details today, but if you're interested in all the gory details, we have a JIAR paper, Learning Explanatory Rules from Noisy Data, which goes into all the details. So I'll give a little bit of background. I'll describe our system, differentiable ILP, and I'll um, show some experiments. So the general task, as almost all the talks today have been about, is learning general procedures from examples. So we have some input-output examples. We want to learn some general procedure that transforms the inputs into the outputs. So for example, if our input is a list and our output is an integer, we want some general function that transforms the list into an integer. Or if our input is a list of lists and our output is a list of lists, we want a general function that transforms it. I shall briefly consider three approaches, symbolic program synthesis, neural program synthesis, and neural program synthesis. Um, I will focus on the third one. Okay, so first of all, symbolic program synthesis. So here, we start with our input-output examples, and we produce an explicit human-readable program. And we use a symbolic search procedure to find that program. So for example, given these input-output examples, it produces the following programs using some sort of symbolic search. So some prominent state-of-the-art examples include Magic Haskler, which you can um, find online and actually um, use, which I really recommend if you're uh, new to these systems. Lambda squared, Igor, Progol, and Metagol. So these are prominent examples of symbolic program synthesis um, methods. These approaches have some very compelling features. They are data efficient. They, you can um, learn a program from a handful of examples, even sometimes one example, as Richard was showing earlier today. So they're very data efficient. They produce something which is interpretable and human readable, an actual program. They often, because of the strong bias towards um, the language bias, they generalize very well outside the initial training data. However, the major issues with these systems is they're not always, or not often, robust to any mislabeled data. So if, if you give them any input-output examples which are badly labeled, they are often unable to learn the desired program. And perhaps even more seriously, they're not robust to ambiguous data. So symbolic program synthesis techniques assume that you start with some discrete symbolic input you know, ASCII, something like that. What they're not able to do is handle data from the real world. Imagine you're a robot with a little camera going around and you don't know exactly what digit it is you're looking at. All you see is a, an array of pixels and you've got some probability distribution over what um, number it is, but you're not exactly sure. Symbolic program synthesis techniques are not able to cope with ambiguous, fuzzy, real world data. So though they have some very appealing features, they also have a couple of areas of weakness. Next is neural program induction. So here, given some input-output pairs, a neural network learns a general procedure for mapping the inputs to the outputs. Here, there's no explicit program generated. The procedure is implicit in the weights of the model. So these approaches take some low-level model of computation, a Turing machine, a push-down automaton, a cellular automaton, provide a differentiable execution of that, and then learn to execute it. But what they are not able to do is spit out a human-readable program. Now these approaches, as Richard emphasized earlier today, have some different complementary strengths and weaknesses. They tend not to be very data efficient. They need thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of examples before they can learn the target program. 
they're not generally interpretable. You can't see what procedure it is they've learnt. You just have a large tensor of floating point numbers. They don't always generalize well outside the training data, although there are some recent impressive examples that Dawn was mentioning this morning where they generalize very well. In general, they don't always. However, the, what they're very good at is being robust to mislabeled or ambiguous data. Okay, so if we compare this, these two approaches we've just looked at, symbolic program synthesis and neural program induction, the first thing I really want to stress here is they have very complementary strengths and weaknesses. So symbolic program synthesis is very data efficient and interpretable and generalizes well, whereas neural program induction is robust to mislabeled data and even more importantly robust to ambiguous, fuzzy, real world data. So what we'd like is the best of both worlds, a system with the, the strengths of both these. So neural program synthesis as a family of approaches is an attempt to get the best of both worlds. So here, we, given some input-output examples, we're going to produce an explicit human-readable program in some language, but we're going to use some sort of optimization procedure, e.g. gradient descent, to find the program. So examples of this are differentiable ILP, the system I'm about to show you, robust fill, which we shall described just now, and differentiable fourth and end-to-end -end differentiable proving from UCL. So the hope is, Oh, sorry, um, here we just got a table of the different possible approaches. So the x-axis is whether the procedure is implicit or explicit, and the y-axis is whether we're using symbolic search or optimization procedure. And we're going to be focusing on neural program synthesis, where we use a neural network and generate an explicit program, with the hope of getting the best of both worlds. Okay. So our system, differentiable ILP, is a way of inducing logic programs using gradient descent. So specifically learning data log programs, which are logic programs with recursion but no function symbols or negation is failure. Data log has some very appealing properties as a target language for program synthesis because, for example, um, all programs always terminate, but yes, it's highly expressive. So we start with a program template. The program template specifies a huge range of possible clauses, and a program is a, a subset of this enormous set of clauses. We generate from our program template a large set of clauses, and for each clause we have a weight, a clause weight, which indicates how probable it is that that clause is in our program. And then we do a lot of forward chaining inference. So we, we use a um, differentiable model of data logs forward chaining to infer all the results of the data log program. Then we extract some conclusions and can compare them with our um, true labels. Then we back propagate. I'll explain this a bit more in a minute. So instead of thinking of a set of ground atoms, right, it's just a discrete set of ground atoms, we relax everything. So we have um, a valuation as a function from the ground atoms to um, floating point numbers between 0 and 1, representing the probability that they're true. So for every ground atom in the herb brown brace, we um, have such a probability, including the Folsom atom, which um, is always false and operates like a null pointer. So the key um, idea underlying the implementation of our forward chaining inference is that each clause, each um, data log clause, is compiled before the learning takes place into a function from valuations to valuations. So here we have an extremely simple prolog clause data log clause, which says, for all x, if qx, then px. These clauses are read from right to left. And here we have our initial valuation, mapping from ground atoms to probabilities. And this clause induces a function from this valuation to this valuation. And we compile 
all of our clauses into these functions and then amalgamate them. So here, when we're looking at the, uh, the consequences, we have a weight for each clause. So WC is the weight for this particular clause C. And we have our function from valuations to valuations. And then in order to amalgamate the results of these different clauses, we take the softmax according to the weights. And then we amalgamate the previous valuation with the new valuation using probabilistic sum. We also need to do a number of different steps of forward chaining inference. So we do T steps of forward chaining inference by unrolling on your network T times. OK, so we start off with some background axioms. We convert them into an initial valuation. We also generate a large set of clauses. And for each clause, we have an associated clause weight, indicating how likely it is that that clause appears in our program. Then we do our inference over these clauses to deduce the consequences, a differentiable model of forward chaining inference. This is where all the heavy lifting takes place. Then we extract some conclusions and look at the specific atoms that we're interested in and compare these predicted labels with our true labels to get the cross-entropy loss. Then because this path is differentiable, we can back-propagate modifying our clause weights. And we keep doing that until it converges, and then we're able to extract a, um, a readable program from this, <coughs> if it converges to a low entropy solution. OK, so to go into a little bit more detail about this central element of how these clauses are compiled into functions, so we make various restrictions to our data log language, which don't lose us any generality. So we regiment the language. So for example, typical uh, logic programming clauses have as many atoms in the body as you like, but we restrict it to have exactly two atoms in the body without loss of generality. Then we calculate for each ground atom all the pairs of ground atoms that can contribute to its truth. We convert these into indices. We convert into tensors. I'm going to skip over these details in the interest of time. But for example, if we have this rule here, why does um, this particular value here for RAB have 0.72? Well, it's because we look at this ground instance of the rule. We look at the values of the components. We multiply them together, and we compare them with all the others and take the max. OK, so we did a number of different experiments to verify this system. Some of our experiments were standard ILP tasks. Um, so here, we're comparing our system against Metagol, a state-of-the-art ILP system, in arithmetic tasks, list tasks, and graph tasks. These are straightforward symbolic tasks where we're given symbolic input and all data is correctly labeled. At the time of writing, uh, um, there were a couple of these examples that Metagol couldn't do that we can do, but now Metagol, which is a symbolic program synthesis method, uh, fixed a couple of bugs and it can do them too. So a concrete example, we're trying to learn graph cyclicity. So we have some directed graphs. We have some green nodes, which are involved in cycles. And we have some blue nodes, which are not involved in cycles. We have a handful of examples of training data. We want to learn what is the property that distinguishes these green nodes from these blue nodes. So the program that our differentiable ILP system generates is here. It says that X is involved in a cycle. X is a green node if it has this pred relation to itself. And the pred relation is the transitive closure of the edge relation. It's the connected relation. So though this is clearly a simple program, it illustrates two of the hardest things about program synthesis, which is um, synthesizing recursive programs and synthesizing auxiliary helper functions. So in order to work out, right, whether or not a node is green, whether it's involved in a cycle, we had to have this invented predicate, which is the connected relation. These are the two things that makes program synthesis hard. A 
Another example from our discrete set of examples is um, Fizzbuzz. So Joel Bruce had an amusing uh, blog post a couple of years ago, you may have seen it, where he was, um, the idea was he was, uh, I think it's fictitious, but he was given a job interview in which he had to write a Python program to solve the Fizzbuzz game. I don't know if you know this game. It's a children's game where you enumerate the natural numbers, but whenever a number divides by three, you say fizz. And whenever it divides by five, you say buzz. And the idea was that he thought it would be funny, instead of just writing out directly the Python code to do this, he would train a neural network to, um, to learn the Fizzbuzz game. So he trained it on all numbers from 100 to 1,000, holding out as test numbers, the numbers from 1 to 100. Unfortunately, it failed to generalize at all. He, he was using a standard MLP. So this is one of the mo motivating examples for our system. We wanted to really get Fizzbuzz right. So when we applied uh, our differential LP system to it, this is the program it produces for Fizz. So it says that a number is divisible by 3 if it's 0, or it's divisible by 3 if it has this pred1 relation to some other Fizz number. And this pred1 relation is true if x is 3 less than y. So you notice that, again, this is a re involves recursion and two invented predicates. These are the invented predicates. So buzz, a number is a buzz number if it's divisible by 5. One of the real powers of um, program synthesis is that we can do transfer learning. So if we've learned some helper functions in some previous task, we can copy and paste them over into our new task. And this, this is an example where we use that. So a number is a buzz number if it's divisible by 5. And it synthesizes this predicate, pred3, which is true of two numbers if x is 5 less than y. And in order to do that, it uses the predicates that it's synthesized in the last programming task. Okay, so that was examples of just symbolic ILP tasks. But now we're going to get to the more interesting cases where um, some of the data is noisy or ambiguous. Now, standard symbolic program synthesis techniques often fail catastrophically if they're given a single piece of mislabeled data. We wanted to test our differentiable ILP with mislabeled data, so we naughtily and willfully mislabeled some of our um, data. So we have this pro proportion row of the training examples that are willfully and deliberately mislabeled. And we increase row and see how our system does. So here are six of our standard um, ILP tasks, but now the x-axis uh, represents what proportion of the training examples are willfully mislabeled. And the thing that I want to stress is that when we have 10 or 20% mislabeled data, we're still able to learn the right program. So this is real robustness to um, noisy data. But perhaps more importantly, is getting program synthesis techniques to work with ambiguous data, fuzzy data, real-world continuous data. So in this series of tasks, we tried learning um, programs from raw pixels. So instead of being given crisp, symbolic input, we're just given MNIST images. So here, we, we're given two, two images representing two numbers. We have to output a 1 if the left image is less than the right image. This involves two types of generalization. One is just symbolic generalization, and the other is, sorry, one is image generalization, and the other is symbolic generalization. So image generalization is, well, if I've seen some examples of the of the two digit and some examples of the four digit, and I've seen examples where two is less than four, then if I see a new image of a two and a new image of a four, I should, be, I should still think that's less. Two is still less than four. This kind of generalization neural networks are very good at. Symbolic generalization is different though. Supposing I've seen that two is less than three, and I've seen that three is less than four, and I have some reason to believe, looking at other training data, that the relation is transitive, then I should be able to infer that 2 is less than 4, even if I've seen no examples of 2 being less than 4 in my training.
So if you give a human all these examples, but even if you cut out some of these examples, right, we will start to suspect that there's a transitive relation here and therefore be able to fill in the data. Symbolic generalization. <coughs> So first we created a, a baseline neural network to solve this task. So this was just a standard convolutional net which was fed in the two MNIST images and then had a, a vector of 20 digits, fully connected layer, and then outputs are one and a zero. And we train this on lots and lots of pairs of images. Now if you give it lots and lots of examples of every single pair of numbers, then the neural network baseline can solve this task quite straightforwardly. However, as you start to hide pairs of numbers, so you give it less and less pairs of numbers, then as you continue to do this, the simple neural network will degrade almost linearly because it, it doesn't have an inductive bias towards things like transitivity. It's effectively just memorizing certain pairs, and it doesn't know what to do if it hasn't seen all the data. So then we tried this same problem, learning the less than relation from pure images with our differentiable ILP system. So we've made one change to it, a simple change to it. Instead of just having these axioms here in the top left corner, we have one extra element. So we have a convnet, a pre-trained convnet, passing in um, information about the two images into the very same neural network that I showed, the same, this same system that I showed you before. So when we do this, and we train it and train it and let it converge, it spits out um, a, a readable program. What this pre program says is, output of one, the target predicate is true, output of one, if the left image is less than the right image. The PRED2 the pred two relation here just is the less than relation. So here it is learning a fully general less than relation from pure um, pixels. So now this is a graph that compares our differentiable ILP system with our neural network baseline. So on the x-axis is the proportion of pairs of data that have been held out during training, i.e., how, you know, how much of this stuff has been removed. And the y-axis is the, is the test error. And the point I want to stress here is that the, the neural network, the, the baseline, degrades more or less linearly as you hold out more and more pairs, whereas our differentiable ILP system, because it has an inductive bias towards recursion in general and transitivity in particular, is still able to find a nice program even when it's only seen 40% of the different pairs of numbers. So to summarize, this differentiable ILP system is aiming to combine the advantages of symbolic program synthesis with the advantages of neural program induction, being data efficient and being able to learn interpretable and general rules, and being robust to noisy or ambiguous data. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Have you considered combining uh, DILP with symbolic program synthesis to find bugs? Sorry, to find bugs? That's right. So you mean given an existing program? Yeah, suppose that someone implemented, uh, let's say, like a square root program on floats or integers or something, and for some reason it happened to fail at zero. Like it would give 2 to the 16 instead of zero, let's say. Yeah. Um, no, we haven't considered that. It's an interesting idea. I haven't considered it at all for that. Thank you. Hey. Hi. Interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions. The first one was 
obviously this is a declarative program, and so as a consequence, the order in which the, the, the statements um, exist within the completed program don't matter so much except for the inductive definitions where you have sort of a base case for a predicate and then you have a, another one. Is that, I, so, yeah. Sorry. So yeah, good question, good point. Um, so in uh, prologue, as I'm sure you know, the order of the clauses actually matters an awful lot. The prologue is not a purely declarative language. So if you, re right. if you reorder the clauses, it can make a difference between terminating and not terminating. So we're using data log, which is a com is purely declarative um, lang syntactical subset of prologue, which does not have the, it has also a different semantics it uses forward chaining rather than back. What, the end result of all this is it doesn't matter at all what order you have it. So we're totally free from the sort of problems that you get. So, so, so I was I was curious um, whether you could comment on the applicability of this for for a procedural program or some sort of a program in which the order of the statements in the program actually matter, as opposed to just having a bag of of. Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, this, oh, okay, so it's, it's a very good question. Yeah, so the actual mechanics of how we currently do it do indeed presuppose, like you say, that the order doesn't matter. And so we would have to do some changes to the low level uh, approach in order to get it to work with that. But I think in principle, we could modify it, but yes. <laughs> So, so, I'm, I'm, so the second question was, I was curious how you distinguish between what you refer to, I think, as ambiguous or mislabeled, mislabeled data and data that just requires some sort of specialization of the, of the program. So for example, I could probably say registered in, conf in conference X implies wearing pants X, except that there's some exceptions to that rule. There are a few people around who are not wearing pants. And would you see those people as, as or would the, the program try to fit the data or would the, it uh, to, to reflect those sort of special cases or would it, it um, reflect those as just, uh, treat those as just ambiguous data and throw them out. And maybe there's a way around that for you to. So the, okay, that's a good question. So the, the standard way to do this is some sort of uh, Bayesian inference, right? Where, so where our posterior is based on the likelihood, which is basically how well it fits the data, and also some prior based on program length, which is just a nice way to, you know, compare in an unbiased way how um, something which is very specific and fits the data but is longer and has extra conditional clauses in, as opposed to something that is simpler that doesn't fit the data. Right, so, and I can imagine having two clauses, one clause that, that might differentiate, for example, based on gender or some other, yes. and, and another clause that doesn't, and both of them existing within your bag of clauses and trying to decide whether you want, understanding that one is, is more of a specialization or refinement of the others and, and maybe you know, sort of analog, analogous to overfitting the data versus underfitting yeah. the data, yeah. more constructing a function that's more general but versus one that's more specialized and whether you, whether you have any knobs to... Uh, right, so um, that's a very good question. So in each run, it'll, if it converges, it'll, it'll generate one program, but the, the, I think the right answer to your question is to run it multiple times, uh, look at the error plus the program length, and then do Bayesian posterior inference in order to compare the different ones. Thank you. Hi, my question is that how hard is the optimization problem, and do you see any uh, special char character of the objective function? It, so, so we are just... You, we are just using standard gradient descent to minimize the log loss. But though I have seen this recently just come out, you may have seen it, um, submission to NIPS just recently, other types of optimization with a slightly different loss function. So for example, using Newton's method to, to also generate uh, logic programs in a similar way. Always have reasonable convergence. Oh, sorry. No, 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 sorry, no, we don't. Sorry, that didn't mean that's a question. No, absolutely. So, so just to be uh, frank, um, these neural methods, when they're learning um, programs, don't always find it. They get stuck in local minima a lot. I might, having talked to people on the ground, my understanding that's true of almost all the various systems in different groups around the world, right? Systems that 
uh, learning programs using, using neural networks get stuck in local minima um, increasingly large amount of the time as the programs get more complicated. So that, that is a real issue. Um, to prove that, say, a million thirty-six is even, to ask whether it is even, like a big number, like a million thirty-six, your program would have to first use forward chaining. So first prove that two is even, then with that it would use say that four is even and six is even, which seems different to the way like we do it, right? Uh, do you have any comment on that? <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it is totally different. Um, and certainly, it won't scale. The forward chaining like this won't scale to those sort of issues, to those very large. Um, I agree. You're highlighting a real issue with this sort of technique um, and how it will scale. And it's, it's a fair point. Thank you. Thank you.